Right, hi, I'm Josh, and today uh, I'm going to be talking about TensorFlow Probability, which is a project I've been working on for two years now. So what is TensorFlow Probability? So we are uh, part of the TensorFlow ecosystem. Um, it's a library built using TensorFlow, and the idea is to make it easy to combine deep learning with probabilistic modeling. Um, we're useful for statisticians and data scientists, uh, to whom we can provide R-like capabilities um, which take advantage of GPU and, and TPU, and to ML researchers and practitioners, um, so you can build deep models which capture uncertainty. So why should you care? So a neural net that predicts binary outcomes is just a Bernoulli uh, distribution that's parameterized by something fancy. Um, so suppose you have this, you've got your sort of V1 model, looks great, now what? Um, that's where TensorFlow Probability can help you out. Um, using our software, uh, you can uh, encode additional information in your problem, you can control prediction variants, um, you can even possibly ask tougher questions. No longer assume that pixels are independent because guess what, they're not. Um, this is what we're gonna be talking about. So the main take home message for this talk is TensorFlow Probability is a bunch of low-level tools, a collection of low-level tools, which are aimed at trying to make it easier for you to express what you know about your problem. To not try to shoehorn your problem into a neural net architecture, but rather describe what you know and take advantage of what you know. And uh, these sort of images over here, we'll talk about a few of them, but e each of them represents um, a part of the TensorFlow probability package. Okay, so in the simplest form, how would you use TensorFlow probability? It's sort of like a get our feet wet type example. So we offer generalized linear models. Uh, think logistic regression, linear regression. Um, very boring stuff, maybe, but uh, it's a good starting point. So you'll see this pattern throughout the TensorFlow probability software stack and how you use it, but basically you specify a model, in this case Bernoulli, corresponding logistic regression, and then you just fit it. And in this case, we're using L1 regularization and L2, so you can get sparse weights. And why you should care about this is it's using a second order solver under the hood, which means that up to floating point precision, you would never need more than 30 iterations of this. And in practice, maybe three or four is all it takes. Um, and since you can take advantage of GPU, it's like a drop-in replacement uh, that takes advantage of GPU, uh, uh, drop-in replacement uh, for say R in this case. Okay, so that's just kind of the canned, like an example of some of the canned stuff we offer. The, where things really get exciting um, are this sort of suite of tools. So first we're gonna talk about distributions, um, which are probably what you think they are. Uh, we'll also talk about bijectors in this talk. Um, TensorFlow probability provides probabilistic layers, things that wrap up variational inference um, with, uh, uh, with different distributional assumptions. We have a probabilistic programming language, um, which is the successor of Edward. That's also part of the TensorFlow probability um, package. And then on the inference side, that's kind of for building models. Um, on the inference side, uh, we've got a collection of Markov chain Monte Carlo um, transition kernels and tools to use them, diagnostic criteria, that sort of thing, tools for variational inference in a numerically stable way, and various optimizers like stochastic gradient, Langevin de descent, uh, uh, BFGS, Nelder Mead, sort of the stuff not stochastic gradient descent, um, maybe some of which are more useful for single machine settings, um, others baking in probability with optimization. Okay, so distribution, I hope this is boring because nothing here uh, should be really fancy. Capability of drawing samples, you can compute probability, CDF, one minus the CDF, mean, variance, all the usual stuff. A little more interesting here at the bottom, the event shape, and you can't see it, but it says batch shape. So TensorFlow uh, probability distributions, uh, to take advantage of vectorized SIMD um, hardware, you specify, you call the distribution once, but you specify it multiple parameters. So um, here's an example. Uh, we're building a normal, but we're passing two location parameters. So when you call sample on this, it's gonna return two samples every one, time you call sample, that makes sense. One will correspond to the normal distribution parameterized with mean minus one, the other with mean one. It turns out this very simple idea 
is extremely powerful and lets you immediately take advantage of um, vector computation. So not only that, uh, not only do distributions have this sort of like small tweak from other libraries or packages, um, but we've got a bunch of them and you can combine them in interesting ways. So it's not super important what distribution this is. The point is we're making a mixture, combining categorical distributions with multivariate normal, with a diagonal parameterization, and it all just kind of fits together and you can do sort of cool things using simple building blocks. And that's a theme that's pervasive in TensorFlow probability. Simple ideas scaled up to, um, to, uh, to be a powerful framework and formalism. So here's a, another example of a distribution we have, Gaussian processes. Um, I think this is cool because in a few lines you can uh, learn uncertainty. So notice that the model has um, sort of different beliefs in areas where there's no data and it's tight where there is. Um, you could easily turn this into a layer in your neural net if you wanted to. Um, okay, so distributions, there's a bunch of them. They have these sort of batch semantics. They're cool. Um, onto our second building block, bijectors. So a bijector is useful for transforming a random variable. It is, um, think like log and exp. Um, you may, on the forward uh, transformation, take the, uh, uh, the exponential of some random variable, and then to reverse it, you take the logarithm. So the forward is useful for computing samples, and the inverse is useful for computing probabilities. So a bijector is a bijective, um, diffeomorphism, a differentiable isomorphism between two, um, two spaces, and those spaces represent sort of an input random variable and an output random variable. And uh, because we're interested in computing probabilities, we have to keep track of the Jacobians, it's just change of variables in an integral, and, um, and so that's what this implements. We also have notion of shape, because here again, everything supports these sort of batch shape semantics. Um, so what would you use a bijector for? So this is a Behind this slide is an amazing idea. You can take a neural net and use it to, to transform any distribution you want and sort of get an arbitrarily rich distribution. So this um, little piece of code here really is just two hidden layers, uh, two dense hidden layer neural net, and then um, it's wrapped up inside this autoregressive flow bijector, which transforms a normal. Now here's why this is amazing. You could plug this in as your loss in the output of, like this could be your loss, basically, the, this final line here. Uh, whoops, I shouldn't have done that. On the final line, it's just this distribution dot log prob. That's an arbitrarily rich distribution capable of learning variance not prescribed by, like a Bernoulli, the variance is p times one minus p. And unless your data actually is generated by a Bernoulli distribution, that's a fairly restrictive assumption, in part because, uh, 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 anytime that's not case, uh, it's very sensitive uh, to misspecification. So this is like a much richer family and it sort of combines immediately neural nets and uh, distributions. So um, another cool thing, you can reverse bijectors and this little one line change was a whole other paper. And we see this phenomenon in TensorFlow probability a lot. Um, because everything's low level and modular, one little change, brand new idea. Okay, so that's kind of some background. Let's like go through an example of how um, you might use this. So this is from uh, a book, Bayesian Methods for Hackers, which we'll talk about at the end. And the question is, uh, so I guess the guy who wrote this book, he got a girlfriend, and at some point, uh, his text messaging frequency changed. So the question is like, can we find that in the data? Um, and maybe you'd guess 22 days, or maybe 40 some days, I don't know, let's see. So here's a simple model, we'll pause it that uh, there was a rate of text messages in some pre-period and a rate in some post-period. And the question is, was there a changeover? And that's the sort of math or statistical program, as I like to call it. That statistical program translates into TensorFlow probability in an almost one-to-one -one way. Exponential, uniform, flip it over, final Poisson. And to compute the joint log prob, we just add everything up in log space. And using that, we can sample the, from the posterior. And so what we find is, yes, there was one rate around 18 uh, uh, text messages a day, I guess, another around 23, and it turns out that the highest posterior probability was on day 44. So how did we get these posterior samples from the joint log probability? We used MCMC. So our MCMC library has several transition kernels, um, I think, one of the more powerful ones, because it takes advantage of automatic differentiation, is Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. 
And all we do to use that is take our joint log prob, which you saw in the previous slide, and just pin whatever you want to condition on. So in this case, we're going to condition on count data, and we want to sample the tau and the two lambdas, the rates and the changeover point. Um, so we set this up. We, whoops. We ask for some number of results, burn-in steps, sort of usual MCMC business. Something a little different here is this transformer. The transformer takes a constrained random variable and unconstrains it because HMC is taking a gradient step and it may step out of bounds. And so since the lambda, had, the lambda terms are rates of a Poisson, they need to be positive. So the X bijector goes to and from positive real to um, unconstrained real. So too with tau, that was a, uh, on the 0, 1 interval. And so using sigmoid, which you can't see here, we uh, transform to and from. And 40, day 44, it turns out that really was when he started dating. And so it seems like Bayesian uh, inference was right. OK, so super hard graphical model, which we won't talk about. But the point is, there's a whole lot of math here. And it's really scary. Not really. Each line basically transforms one to one. So you pull out some graphical model from the literature before neural nets got really popular again. And you can uh, code it up in TensorFlow probability. And where things get amazing is you can actually parameterize these distributions with a neural net, thus getting the benefit of both. And you can differentiate through the whole thing. So it's really sort of what's old is new again, um, yet in a way that you can take advantage of modern hardware. So just one-to-one -one between math and TFP. OK, so we did see a little bit of the deep learning, the masked uh, autoregressive flow. And I mentioned you can reparameterize stuff. Uh, so, so here's sort of the idea of reparameterization. So as we know, probabilistic graphical models tend to be computationally very intensive. Neural nets are really good at lowering the, uh, at uh, embedding data into a lower dimensional space. Why not take your complex, uh, computationally intensive probabilistic graphical model and parameterize it with a neural net? And that's kind of what this slide is saying we should think about doing. So um, you've heard of uh, uh, GANs. So variational autoencoders are kind of the probabilistic analog of a GAN. Um, that's the adversarial networks um, trying to fight each other to come up with a good balance. It actually has a probabilistic sort of analog, and this is it. So um, in this case, the posterior distribution takes, say, an image and outputs a low dimensional, uh, is a distribution over um, a low dimensional space Z. And um, the likelihood is a distribution that um, takes a low dimensional representation and outputs back the image. And using variational inference, which really just consists of 10 lines of code, you can take these different distributions which are themselves parameterized by neural nets, and just fit it with Monte Carlo variational inference, um, taking advantage of TensorFlow's automatic differentiation. So it all kind of fits together nicely. OK, so that was a, a lot of information that we kind of breezed through quickly. Um, we are in the process of rewriting this Bayesian Methods for Hackers book using TensorFlow probability. Um, it already exists as, um, I think it was like a PyMC version of it. And so um, we've started all the chapters. One and two are in the best shape. So definitely start with those. In chapter one, you'll find the um, text message example. Um, but that's, that's basically it. So uh, in conclusion, TensorFlow probability um, helps you combine deep learning with probabilistic modeling. So you can uh, encode additional domain knowledge about your problem. PIP install, easy to use. Um, and you can check it out as part of the TensorFlow ecosystem to learn more. Thanks. And I've got a few minutes here for questions, if anyone has any. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, um, can I quantify uncertainty in a neural net, basically, using this stuff? And the answer is absolutely yes. That's why you would use this stuff. In fact, the larger question of why would you even use probabilistic modeling is probably because you want to quantify uncertainty. And so I pulled back to this variational autoencoder slide because uh, what's happening is this, like, it's a little hard to see here because it's just code. 
Um, but this low dimensional space is basically inducing uncertainty as a bottleneck. And all of your neural nets do this. Often you'll have um, a smaller hidden layer going from a larger hidden layer to a smaller back to a larger. So the point with this is just do that in a principled way. Keep track of what you lose by sort of compressing it down. And, um, and in so doing, then you actually get a measure of how much you lost. And so while this is variational autoencoder, the supervised learning sort of alternative to this would be variational information bottleneck. And the code for that is almost exactly the same. The only difference is you're reconstructing a label from some in input x. So you go from x to z to y. So image, low dimensional, back to the, the thing you're trying to predict. OK, so I'm out of time. And uh, with that, I will take it over to you.